Yes. 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 Wow, this channel just hit 20,000 subscribers. It wouldn't have been possible without all of you guys watching, liking and commenting on the videos and of course subscribing. So thank you so much for all of your support. I'm truly grateful to each and every single one of you. This is actually the first Q&A on the channel and I thought I would answer as many questions as I could while I go about my day. Also, my friends over at Motion VFX have decided to help me celebrate this milestone by doing a giveaway of M Film Look. It's a fantastic plugin with loads of features and I've spoken about it on the channel before, so I'll leave a link to a more in-depth review if you'd like to check it out. But they also have a special little surprise for everyone that watches this video, so stay tuned for that. So, Miggy has a question. He says, how did you get started on Final Cut Pro and what made you stay? Well, I started at a video production company on Final Cut Pro 7, and when Final Cut Pro 10 came out, I honestly hated the magnetic timeline. So much so that I tried to switch to Premiere, which I hated even more, and then I decided to stick with Final Cut Pro 7 for a while. A few updates of Final Cut Pro 10 came out and I gave it another try, and then I fell in love with the magnetic timeline. I love how fast I can edit with it and how much it speeds up my workflow. Dylan Bates, the Final Cut Bro, is asking, I would like to ask, who is your favorite Dylan? No, for real, what has been one of your favorite tutorials you've made? I'd say my favorite tutorial that I've made is my infinite loop effect. That one was really fun. I'll leave a link to that down below if you haven't already seen it. And in terms of my favorite Dylan, if you don't know, he's talking about himself and Dylan John, both incredible creators on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to them already, you should. But in terms of my favorite Dylan, that's actually a really easy one to answer. My favorite Dylan is obviously... Adventures of Jason and Kim want to know, have you ever thought about making videos on how to succeed on YouTube, title, SEO, etc.? Well, I don't think I'm necessarily the most qualified person to talk about that sort of stuff, but I do feel like I've learned a lot in the last couple of years about creating titles, optimizing keywords and that sort of thing. Um, but I owe a lot of what I've learned to channels like Film Booth and Think Media and stuff. So if you're looking to kind of improve your YouTube game in that sense, go ahead and check those two channels out. They're pretty good. Mark, question about stock footage providers. I can only choose one as they get pricey for a non-US dollar earner. Yeah, they do. Artgrid or Envato, or perhaps another like Storyblocks. Well, I think it depends on what you're using the stock footage for. Artgrid footage is super cinematic and really high quality. And if that's the main thing that you're after, then Artgrid is great. But Artgrid doesn't have the widest range of subject matter compared to Storyblocks and Envato Elements. If you need a lot of variety, then one of those, I think, is a better bet. Storyblocks is $30 per month, but Envato Elements is only $16.50 per month, and you also get access to stock images, sound effects, music, video templates, and a whole lot of other stuff. So if budget is the main concern, then I think you get the most bang for your buck with Envato. Question from Steve. I battle with balancing the volume levels when including music, sound effects, and narration in a video. I was told to keep the music at minus 20 dBs and work from there, but I find minus 20 is too soft, so I use minus 12. Do you have any rules or guides that you use when working with sound, which includes all three of these? Well, volume levels are relative in my opinion. If you look at these two tracks, both are set to minus 6 dBs, but the waveforms are very different. So at the end of the day, you're going to have to listen and make a call on what sounds right to you, but I can give you some guidelines that might be a good starting point. I usually keep my dialogue between minus 3 dB and minus 6 dB. Music on its own with nothing underneath would be between minus 6 and minus 12 dBs. And I would generally put music that's under dialogue anywhere between minus 18 to minus 24 dBs, depending on the type of music. 
I also sometimes EQ out certain frequencies to make the dialogue stand out a bit more, and I did a video on that which I'll link to down below. As far as sound effects go though, it really depends on the type of sound effect. So my rule of thumb is, if it's a sound effect that complements something on screen but isn't the main focus, like this, then I want it loud enough to easily be heard, but not too loud that it overpowers my voice or distracts the viewer from what's being said. If the sound effect accompanies the thing that I want the viewer to focus on, then I'll make it louder, like this for example. Travis said, wow, Travis has a bunch of questions. Okay, let's do these in rapid fire fashion. What's the destination of the next family vacation? Either the UK or Portugal. What tips and tricks will you offer for time-lapse videos? If they are static time-lapses, add some scale and position keyframes to create some dynamic movement. Also try using a free motion blur adjustment layer to add motion blur to the fast moving subjects in the scene like cars or clouds. Advice for growing one's channel from your perspective. Um, focus on consistency. The more you create, the more you're practicing and the better you'll get. Also try to stick to posting weekly because that forces you to create and it forces you to get something done as opposed to just sitting on an idea and not creating anything. So I think consistency in that way is probably your best bet. New tattoo ideas for you. What, when, what, where, when? Um, well, I think I'm done, I think. But when I got this one, this little tattoo, I thought it would be my last, my one and only. And here we are with a full sleeve. So who knows, maybe a dragon neck tat? I know my mom would love that. Um, for a very small creator like myself, is the new FCPX bundle at $99 worthy of a purchase? I'm not sure which bundle you're referring to exactly, but as far as bundles go, I think you need to decide on what area of your videos you're trying to improve. There's no point buying a plugin with tons of lower third titles, for example, if you don't really have a need for lower third titles, because some bundles come with all sorts of stuff. So some have overlays or other graphic elements that might be more useful to you. So I'd say Envato has a bunch of great FCP bundles. So most of them you can either buy once off, or if you subscribe to Envato Elements, you can download as many of the bundles as you like. So that's something to consider. Or if you're looking for more specific bundles, like maybe something that's geared towards YouTubers and YouTube graphics, you could take a look at something like MTuber from Motion VFX. It's time for lunch. Got a nice tasty little spread. Let's talk about the giveaway. Motion VFX have supported this channel for a long time and they decided to help us celebrate hitting 20,000 subscribers by giving away three copies of their amazing M Film Look plugin to three of you guys. M Film Look is great for color grading and adding things like flares, LUTs, aberration, distortion, lens blur, grain, a vignette and letterboxing bars to your footage to make it more cinematic. It also comes with a bunch of different presets that are totally customizable. If you want to learn more about the plugin, I'll link to a review I did on it below, but make sure you check out the description so that you can enter the giveaway. The more steps you follow, the more entries you get, and the greater your chances of winning. But everyone who watches this video can get $20 of store credit to spend on anything you like from Motion VFX. All you need to do is to create an account or login using the link down below, Click on the message icon and ask Motion VFX for your $20 credit by using the code BRAD20 and telling them I sent you. They will add the $20 to your account, so whether you win or not, you can still save yourself some money and buy anything you like. A big thank you to Motion VFX for making this giveaway possible. Nick says, what would you recommend for Final Cut Pro or Photoshop, the Loop Deck or Toolbox? I personally haven't used either of those, so I can't really give you an opinion from the point of view of having used one. But what I can say is that if I was going to spend money on either of those, based on what I've seen online, I would probably go for the Loop Deck. It looks really nice, and I think it has a lot of functionality that maybe the Toolbox doesn't. I use the Monogram Creative Console though, which I absolutely love. I've made a few videos on it before, so I'll link to that down below if you'd like to see more of that. Miguel says, I know a lot of editors who edit above the timeline and a lot who edit on the timeline. What are the pros and cons of both in your experience? Well, I must say I love the magnetic timeline and it can be something to get used to if you're used to traditional timelines like the Final Cut Pro 7 or Premiere Pro timelines, but it's really powerful. I tend to always keep my interview or talking head footage on the timeline or on the primary storyline as Final Cut Pro calls it. With the magnetic timeline, I'm able to cut that up really quickly and that becomes the foundation on which everything else sits. So I'll add my B-roll on top of that 
And if I'm timing a selection of B-roll clips to that talking head footage or interview footage, I'll often group those B-roll clips by selecting them all and hitting Command G. This creates a group that acts like a mini magnetic timeline. So this group is connected to the primary storyline at this connection point, and I can change the order of the clips and trim them really easily and quickly. If I didn't have the group and I made changes to the clips on the primary storyline, the B-roll clips would get all messed up, but by making the B-roll groups above the primary storyline, it's almost like having multiple little magnetic timelines to work with. The only thing that's different really is that the connection points will always be connected to something on the primary storyline. You can't have a group of clips connected to another group of clips. Bangkok Explorer says, I would be interested to hear what you think is the best approach to editing a travel video from start to finish. Do you place all the clips on the timeline first for story, then finesse and add music after? Or do you choose music first and let that dictate your edit? Which approach have you found to lead the best and most efficient results? Great question. Um, I almost always cut to music and I let the music set the mood and help drive the story forward. So generally what I'll do is I'll drop everything I shot on the timeline and I'll start by setting roles for the two camera vlog type footage and then a different role for the B-roll and cutaways. And then I'll decide which parts I want to keep and which must go. At the same time, cutting down the talking head parts to the parts I want to keep. And then I can easily see that I'm going to need music for these B-roll sections between when I'm talking to camera. So I'll find music that I like, drop the tracks in, and then I'll often create cut downs of that music so that I know how much time I want to show the B-roll for in between the talking sections. Then I'll know that I need to cut down a couple of minutes of B-roll to a specific length. That helps me to choose only the best stuff and the stuff that helps to tell the story that I'm trying to tell. And then I cut that all to the beat of the music. At this point, I usually watch the whole edit back to see if it's all making sense or if it flows, if any section feels too long or drawn out, and then I'll refine the edit and finesse it. The last few steps would be to add any effects I might want to add, like motion blur or keyframing any movements in the shots. I'll do some color grading, add sound effects, and then I'll watch it again. At the end of every workday, I love going for a walk with my family. My son's just started walking, so it's the highlight of my day every day. Let's answer another question. We have one here from Travel Paradise. Which is the most friendly or compatible 4K camera footage for Final Cut Pro at the moment using iPhone? I would personally shoot at 4K 24 frames per second or 4K 60 frames per second if you need the slow-mo. Most of the newer phones can do that these days. If you go into the camera settings on your iPhone though, you can change the format to most compatible, which will shoot in a less compressed codec. So if you're not worried about storage space and you want the best quality, then you can switch to that here. Sunny has a question about remote editing workflows. He says, currently we're using PostLab, but since Blackmagic launched their cloud collaboration tool, my boss is seriously considering switching to DaVinci Resolve. Do you have any alternative remote editing workflows? Well, PostLab is a really good option for remote editing. So is Frame.io. Frame.io has a bunch of remote workflow tools to help you manage proxies and raw footage. So it's definitely worth checking that out if you haven't already. If your hard drives are identical, even down to the name of the hard drive itself, you shouldn't really have any relinking issues. So it sounds like there's something else at play there, something else is wrong with that setup. Alternatively, you could try exporting XML files and sending those between editors, but that's a bit more of a manual approach and your file naming would need to be on point there to avoid any sort of confusion. If PostLab or Frame.io or even the more manual Dropbox approach isn't working for you, I don't necessarily think that the switch to DaVinci Resolve is gonna make it any better. I'll link to an interview with Knut Harker down below. He's the editor of the Netflix film Blood Red Sky, and he used PostLab with his assistant editor with great success. So check that out, and maybe some troubleshooting with PostLab might make it work a little better for you. Thank you all so much again for helping this channel hit 20,000 subscribers. And thank you to all of you who submitted questions as well. This was fun, maybe we should do it again sometime. I have some exciting things planned for the channel and I'm hoping to spend more time on the channel from now on to make those things happen. I've already started turning away some client work in order to focus more energy onto the channel. So if you've ever clicked on any of the links in the description or bought anything I've reviewed, thank you so much because that has really helped support the channel and helps me to keep doing this for you guys. So thank you so much again for the support. Let's see if we can get to 100,000 subscribers. Do you think we can do it?